This week on What's Tracking, we're going to review the DMP from BAE for your MIC DOG. We're here with Colin. We're here with Steve. We're going to have a fun 15 minutes. Let's get right to it. Um, we're also going to talk to Brian Vibberts today. We're, and, but let's get to the news and product info, right, Colin? Yeah. You ready? Go. Let's do this. Um, GoPro camera with a drone is used on the new Superman. For what? To get his shots flying around. Oh my gosh, it's his perspective? Yes. That's amazing. With a drone. I want to do that. What's so cool is like everyone's going to go out and make their own cuts of Superman. So they're going to go copy it because anyone can get this technology now. So you know how they do like knockoffs? Right, right, right. They recreate the scenes. Now you can recreate Superman flying scenes and just All you need is a drone. anywhere in the world. Where it's crazy. That, go do it. And send them in and we'll air it here. What's tracking at gmail.com. I uh, want to talk to you about ProDrenaline software. It's 49 bucks. You could take a clip right out of a GoPro, start editing it, export it, and send what it, some send it on your way. With it? You can stabilize it if you get shaky footage. You can remove the fisheye effect. Fantastic. So say it's your first HD camera, and you're shooting this, and you just want a regular shot, or someone walks in from the side that you don't want in the shot. So you can remove that wide angle fisheye. But another thing you can do is also zoom in. Leave the fisheye like if you so like you can that perspective. Crop the shot. Yeah, you can crop it. Um, the other thing you can do is adjust some colors and of course uh, export. So it's pretty cool software for 49 bucks. It's, it's a nice amazing. starting place. If I you like want to go, if you want to go all in, you get something like After Effects, which is around $400 retail. Another piece of software we want to tell you about is MPEG Stream Clip. It is video conversion software that will take a GoPro uh, records MP4, but you, you may want to go into your DAW in another format. So you can export it on, into whatever format you want out of Stream Clip. Well, that's useful. Oh, it's huge, and it's free. Give it away now. We're giving it away. I like that. We're not giving it away, they're giving it away. I like that. You give can't away, do give it away. away. <laughs> it's not, you can't do the give it away theme when we're not giving well, it away. Okay. They're giving it away. One more time. Give it away now. Another cool product is the MyPro Portable PA System. Now, this is a PA thing, but it's audio. But if you're doing a video shoot, you don't want a big PA system, unless you just have to have, unless you're doing a live band. You want a small PA that sort of vanishes into the set, right? Oh yeah, I remember you with your MyPro. Used it at the trade show, the last yeah, two you, trade yeah, shows. Every time I was trying to present, I heard you. They were, they were the best because I tried going through our audio speakers or different, or just projecting, and we never got the crowds. But with the MyPro, we had crowds sometimes, you know, 50, 100 people yeah. gathering around and everyone could hear. Yeah, that's, it's small. The video too. picked it's, up the, it's like, it's the like audio, so clean. The, the video picked up the audio great. They're only a few, they started a few hundred bucks. Everybody that's doing any kind of recording or video should have a MyPro. We used one on our uh, music session uh, with Brian Vibberts, with the musician Dr. coming ben. up later. We needed, to, we needed to amplify the tabla so the player could hear his performance. So we used the MyPro. Um, they're robust, they're loud for their size, they have a handle, wheels, uh, optional wireless mics. You can, you can use your own mics with them or you can order one that actually screws right into the back of the MyPro. They have slots for them. I like it. Uh, and then they're battery powered too. So you can plug them in, but say you need to move the speaker a few, a few feet. You know, a AV Tech's freaking out because you're moving it and they need to bring another uh, electric drop. No, just unplug it and move it and it, you have a... Well, and you can use that outdoors where you don't have a power source. Absolutely. I like it. I like it. You know, I don't get paid anything from my pro to, to cover sure? this. This is a news item. I don't get paid anything for this. <laughs> I really, you know, that's that's another reason we're doing the show. I love this thing. I tell people about this. Get a MyPro. We, we used it at the show. I think they sold five or six just off the show. People coming by and go, what is that? What's your PA? A lot of people didn't even know where the sound was coming from. They're that small and they yeah, just blend no, in. Yeah, I know what you're saying because I, did, yeah, I didn't know. Right you didn't know that. either. Yeah. We stuck it right below our speaker right, stands right. for our audio speakers for the show. No, that's great. And I'm like, it's right here. You just well, heard my I'm, voice I'm coming out from, glad, right, from the, the voice the of the VOG. The voice of God was coming through. This week we're going to review the DMP from BAE. It's a mic preamp slash DI, which is direct right. instrument input. Yes. Some features of the BAE, it has phase reverse. Yes. That's very important because Avita said he opened up a lot of the new microphones that are coming from the far east are phase reversed. So you have to check that. The way you check that is you zoom into the software, you, you zoom into the waveform, and you look at that first waveform drawing, that first yes. part of the wave. So you, you would- First spike. The first spike. 
of the waveform going like this, oscillating. And if it's going down, it's out of phase. Well, it's you know another easy way? You just, you just push the button. And whatever sounds best is in phase. Or you can use your ears. <laughs> but the quick I'm way sorry. the quick way to check this, and Brian Vibbert showed me this, is to look for that first spike. If the waveform starts going up, it's in phase. If it's going down, it's out. Correct. Uh, the, the DMP comes in a solid steel chassis. They're hand-built in California. They have built-in power supplies, which is, which is huge. You yeah. just grab one thing by the handle. Because there are other, they're more, they're more elaborate studio mic pre's. Same technology, but they have external mic preamps. Well, and they're delicate too. I mean, you can stand on this unit, you can put it on the ground. You're not gonna worry about it getting broken when it's in and amongst your other video gear. And it comes with the same transformers as the original 1073s. That is correct, sir. Input and output. Yep. And they sound, they're, they're the closest. They're in, they, we take them for granted in pro audio. We live in Los Angeles, we go to a lot of studios, and they're in all the studios. But when you go out in the rest of the country, you don't see BAE. Well, and when you're doing video, you can plug a guitar into it. You can really get a, it's a lot of bang for the buck. It's one of those, it's a secret. It's, it is. it's a secret box that professional video guys and audio guys use to amplify the mics. And almost, I would say 95 or 99% of the people making videos and doing audio production work don't even know about them. Well, and Steve made a good point. It's compatible with a lot of other equipment. And it's $11.95. You can connect it to your boom mic, Steve was saying, yeah. and just go to the DMP, and then out to your Tascam recorder, your Zoom recorder, direct to your camera input, yeah. or to something like the Zen if you need a lot more channels, which is, I mean, this is we've talked about before, but um, it's awesome. You need one great channel, grab yourself one of these. $11.95, you can't beat it. Comes with the Jensen, uh, comes with the Jensen Transformer mod now. The Bootsy yeah, when you on the DI, there's a Jensen. Is we call used to call it the Bootsy mod because Bootsy Collins had us do it, and it's just especially for bass players, really cool, really good tonality. And uh, tonight, as I said, we got to jam with some of the best Indian musicians in the world: a sitar player, a sarangi player, tabla player, world class. Well, the tabla player is famous in India. His name, he goes by AK. And I'm not even gonna try and pronounce his name. Um, and they, they came in here and jammed for like an hour and we wow. recorded it into the Zen and uh, with Brian Vibberts, our good friend. Let's take Dr. a look. Vib. Let's take a look at it. today with Brian Vibberts, a multiple Grammy winner and friend of the show. And we're going to talk about first the breakdown used for everything. First there was a tabla. What yes. mic did you use on that? The Sennheiser 421. And on the sitar? AKG 414. And the Serangi? The Lewitt 640. And then you had a couple room mics. That's right. Uh, which were the Lewitt also, Lewitt 340s. And those were set up in a DIN position. Yeah, in a DIN stereo miking technique. And we'll talk about that in a second as mm -hmm. well. We ran all of those. We obviously used mic stands. Yep. Cables. That's right. The Zen Studio. Exactly. A laptop with some software running. And we had a MyPro PA system to amplify the tabla. Yes. So that he could hear himself play that instrument because it's a very low volume instrument. Yeah, and similar to what a musician would need on sp on stage to hear himself, that's what he needed for the recording. So that, that worked out really well as well. Yeah, yeah, he loved it. And we'll talk about what you used on the mix session a bit later, but let's discuss a little more in detail about each one of these uh, components. Okay. So the tabla, you used one microphone. That's right. Uh, the AK, the tabla player, he mixes and blends his two drums himself. So I would rather 
keep his blend of what he wants to do. Uh, so with one microphone, I'm able to keep his blend, and with two microphones, you know, then I wouldn't be able to do that. Do people sometimes overuse microphones? Yeah, you can definitely have too many microphones. You don't need that many. Uh, I mean, I'm guilty as well sometimes of having 20 microphones on a drum set. But uh, when it's appropriate, no. I guess. Yeah, but we wanted to do this with with microphones that you that anyone could get. And not get, uh, not have a lot of like two or three thousand dollar microphones, and kind of keep it simple. And so when you're setting up that mic, I saw you crawling around on the floor. Can you explain what you were doing there? <laughs> yes. Uh, while the musicians were were setting up and tuning and and getting their instruments, you know, all together, uh, I was yeah, I was kind of crawling around the floor like the Grinch and <laughs> listening to the different instruments. Uh, and really hearing where the best sound was coming out of each of the sitar and the serengi, and really getting my ear up close and changing around position to see where I would put that microphone. And so wherever the instrument was sounding best, you put the microphone. That's right. Pretty That's straightforward. Right. Yeah. Um, the, the DIN mic technique. Yes. Let's talk a little about that. Okay. Uh, the DIN uh, microphone technique is just having like the two microphones at a 90 degree angle. And between the capsules is 20 centimeters. And that allows for capturing a group when you're in a smaller space. You could also use the same uh, uh, technique on a piano or a single instrument. But since we were in a, a smaller room, I didn't want to do like a, a wide pair or anything. I just wanted to kind of keep it close. So you have to kind of make that call depending on the, the space that you're using. That's right. And the importance of the room mic is to glue everything together. Is that fair? Yes. Uh, the different different microphones, uh, you really capture the the individual instruments. But later on in mixing, it's nice to have that glue with the stereo pair to really, you know, have the sound of the room as well as the the close miking. And we were able. You're always going to have some bleed from one mic to another. In a live situation, that's, that's normal. It, it's just yeah, leakage is your friend in a, in a lot of situations, you just have to accept it. And so you work with it. So, uh, and the, now we didn't have the MyPro blasting, but we were able to find a level, we kind of set it back That's from right. the, the, the musicians a bit so that it wasn't a part really of the sound or certainly didn't cause feedback. Mm -hmm. A couple times we heard, we'd, we'd turn it up and then we'd have to turn it back down. So we yeah. avoid, once you avoid feedback, that was no real issue either. That's right. And he was able to hear himself play. So let's discuss for a moment how we use the Zen Studio as the heart of this session. We had all the microphones going into the mic preamps of the Zen, mm -hmm. and then you set up a monitor mix with one of the in built-in mixers. Right. Yeah, I had one of the mixes to go for me for the headphones so I could not just hear the mic levels, but I could adjust just to hear as music. And then you auto, we had the performers play and you set mic level for each individual mic inside the Zen software. That's right. And we also set up a second mix for that tabla to the MyPro that we talked about. Yes, so he could hear himself. So it was better. just a mixer with just the tabla routed to it. That's right. Going out to the MyPro. And then it, we activated each channel for each mic input mm -hmm. in uh, Logic. You can use Pro Tools, you can use any number of uh, Studio One or any number of DAW software. And then we tracked each one of those individually and you went back and mixed them. That's right. One, one important thing I would say is when recording anywhere, whether in studio or like we did here, is when the musicians are just setting up and, and doing whatever, put, every, put all the, the mics in record ready and hit record and do a test to make sure that everything is ready. You're not going to get a spinning wheel on your laptop or anything like that. Just make sure that everything will go into record smoothly. So have a trial run. That's right. We, you know, just do that. It doesn't matter if there's any audio even going to it, as long as there's uh, the same number of inputs in record. Then you, then you know, okay, when the musicians are ready, I'm ready. So when you mix down back at your room, you use Pro Tools. That's right. So it didn't matter that we tracked in Logic. We just took the files, put them on your hard drive, and then you dragged those into Pro Tools. Yeah. Um, how, what did you use on each instrument in the mix? For the Tabla, I used a UA-1176, the Waves uh, Neve EQ, which I love, the 1081, 
and a little bit of limiting. And how much EQing? Was, was there any frequency bump? Yeah, there was quite a bit of like 3K and, and the upper frequencies, quite a bit. Cool. Yeah, I really get that smack. Gotcha, to accentuate that mid-range yeah. of the instrument. And the sitar? The sitar uh, was a little bit of the same thing. It kind of rolled off some of the lows and just kind of notched out a few frequencies that, that I didn't like. Same plugins? Uh, the Sony Oxford EQ for not doing the notches, and then uh, the Waves 1176 and the same EQ. And on the Serangi? Serangi, let's see uh, the screenshot I have here. Uh, same uh, thing with the Sony Oxford EQ to kind of take out any frequencies that were not ideal. And then I actually used the UA Studer A800 tape simulator to get rid of a little bit of the high and kind of soften that a bit. And then the, the Puig Child 660. So some things like the tape plugin, if you don't have, the most important thing is to make sure you EQ a little bit. Now, when you said you took away some frequencies that were maybe problematic, you boost those first, right? You make sort of yeah, a narrow cue, that's right. and you do a sweep, and you look for that for that frequency error yeah. problem, and then you cut it, right? That's right, and a very, very tight notch, usually. And on the final mix, did you put something on the whole mix at the very end? Just a little bit of EQ. Yeah, most of it was done with uh, manual rides of really trying to, you know, get each instrument out at different points. Well, this, the final result sounded great and it was very natural and we really appreciate you breaking all this Thanks. down. Thanks, I had fun. Thanks. I think all the musicians had a great time as well. It was a good experience for everyone. We've got to do it again. Let me know when. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Colin, we had fun. We had an amazing time. Steve, I'm a change man. thanks again. Uh, thanks for viewing. We'll be back next week. Hey, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and comment. Oh, and I almost forgot, we have a new segment called Ask Avitas. Yes. We'll be talking about this every week, but write us with your questions for Avitas. We're going to have an answer every week. Sure. I can't believe he agreed to do this. This I is know. so it's, awesome. We're very lucky. We're it's fortunate. so great. Write us at What's Tracking. Uh, say Ask Avitas in the subject, so we zero in on that email. What's Tracking at gmail.com. And whatever question you have about audio or circuit design or whatever it might be, we're going to throw it at Avitas and see what comes back. Awesome. That's fun. Uh, it'll be, it should be fun. We'll see how it goes. Thanks again. We'll see you next week.